All right. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, you have got Clint Brown back here with you talking a little bit about bankruptcy. You know, we haven't done one of these bankruptcy presentations in a number of years. So we thought what, you know, good as time as ever to, to get it done. We're going into the fall. We've started to see a slight increase in bankruptcy filings due to, of course, COVID-19. We are the year of COVID affecting a, a number of areas of the law uh, dealing with community associations. But for introductions, uh, I'm with, as you know, the law firm Roberts, Markell, Weinberg, Butler, Haley. I'm an equity shareholder and I am board certified in residential real estate and property owners association law by the Texas Board of Legal Specialization. I also have a special treat for you today. I've got Miss Mary Shiloh with our law firm. Mary is one of the paralegals working with our community association practice group, and she leads our bankruptcy department. Uh, what's unique about Mary is she is one of the few paralegals here in the state of Texas that is board certified in bankruptcy law. So she is a board certified bankruptcy paralegal, and she's only one of two bankruptcy paralegals that work for a creditor's law firm. So we are very happy to have Mary with us on our on our team at Roberts Markell. And uh, Mary, you want to say hi? Hi. Good morning. I'm so glad everyone's here. We're going to have fun. It'll, it'll be fun. And so as you know, uh, this is presentation, which means that when you signed up, you had the opportunity to click, I need credit. So keep that in mind. If you forgot to click it, but you want the credit, please be sure to let us know so that we give you that proper certificate for accreditation. Uh, we've got roughly about an hour today. And if you have questions, please quit, click on that Q&A button, type in the question. We've got a great team of moderators here today. We've got Lindsay with us and Kyle who are gonna be interrupting us to ask those questions. So if you've got something itching that you really wanna ask as we're going through this presentation, please feel free, let us know. Mary and I are here to field questions and that's how I like the presentation. I like it to be as interactive as possible. So here's some of the goals we're gonna be hitting on today. We're gonna to be discussing the, uh, the famous or infamous automatic stay 11 USC 362 and what that means for you as a manager and or accountant or a board member for that matter. Uh, we're going to talk about statutory provisions and lien stripping. What that means. What is a lien strip? We're going to be getting into accounting for both accountants and managers and again understanding for the board. Splitting hairs and accounts pre-petition versus post-petition What's a proof of claim? What do all of those terms of art mean? Uh, Mary and I are gonna be digging into that. Finally, we'll, we'll move on to proofs of claim. And then what is, what is a discharge and what is a dismissal? So those are our goals here today. And keep in mind, this is kind of a 101 course. So we're teaching this with a, with an, a mindset that, hey, we understand you may not know much about bankruptcy and we're here to kind of educate. First and foremost, we have got 11 USC 362. It is the stop sign, the do not pass go. You must stop any and all types of collection activity. So what is the automatic stay? Go to the next slide. Ms. Shiloh, I will pass this off to you. Talk, t tell us a little bit about what the automatic stay is from a kind of a statutory perspective. Okay, so when we're dealing with a homeowner, one of your homeowners filing a bankruptcy, what we're talking about and what's key importance to remember about the automatic stay are two words. They're really simple. Any act, any, any act. So, what the op automatic stay does is it operates as a federal injunction. Okay, so we're not talking about county court and state court. We're talking about federal, federal judges, sweeping powers. So the injunction stays any act, two words, any act, to create, perfect, or enforce any lien against any property of the estate. Now, let me throw in real quick 
sometimes we look at these accounts and you say, no, wait a minute. The property is in the name of Mr. Smith, but it was Mrs. Smith that filed bankruptcy. Can we still foreclose? The answer is no, because it's the property that receives the stay and the person, but the property receives the stay. So you're stayed against, two words, any act against the property, okay, or the person. Now, who gets a stay? Who gets to have a stay? What about these people that are just in and out for years in the bankruptcy process? And haven't we seen enough of those? So most debtors automatically receive the automatic stay, unless, and this is in accordance to bankruptcy reform that took place in 2005, which Clint will mention later. A bankruptcy, if a bankruptcy was dismissed within one year of the current bankruptcy that has been filed, okay, then the debtor, your homeowner, has to go before the court and they have to ask permission to have an automatic stay. Now, can we object to that? Sure, sure we can. The likelihood of us getting it sometimes is lowered, especially if the mortgage company is not also objecting to it. That's just a point to keep in mind. Now, if two or more bankruptcy cases, two or more, were dismissed within one year of the current bankruptcy filing, guess what? There's no stay. But, as Clint can explain better than anyone, there are contractual obligations for your associations if we are listed and scheduled in the chapter 13 plan. Thank you, Mary, I appreciate that. So what are we talking about here um, in relation to the automatic state generally? Any kind of action that you take as a management company, as a board, or us as legal counsel, if we are attempting to collect a debt that is protected by the automatic stay, we have violated the automatic stay. So what does that entail, Mary? We've got phone calls. Sure. Have you seen, have you seen violations via fax? Yes. Yeah. Emails. What was that? Phone calls, emails, letters, 209 letters, demand letters of any kind. Yep. And a statement of account can actually violate the automatic stay if you are trying to collect pre-petition amounts and you're making a threat for further collection activity. So it's, you know, it's a bit of a tight rope. You've got to walk when there is an active bankruptcy in play. That's why it's so important, and we'll discuss this in a little bit, so important to notify your counsel the minute you find out about a bankruptcy, whether it be through phone call, email, fax, letter, just stop everything you're doing and reach out to your counsel to make sure you're doing everything properly. To Mary's point on the persons, and look, I think every manager and uh, accountant on this phone probably has dealt with a debtor in the past who has filed four, five, six, seven, eight bankruptcies over the past years. And to Mary's point, there are things your attorney can do they may be able to file what's called a motion for in rem relief from the automatic stay. That is going to give you some additional bankruptcy protection. And look, judges do not like bankruptcies being viewed as a sword. They want to view a bankruptcy filing as a shield because that's what the bankruptcy code is there for. It is to protect that consumer debtor from its creditors so that he or she can get back on their feet and turn over the new leaf. But when the debtor starts trying to use it as a sword over and over again, it gets that debtor into trouble. And judges, bankruptcy judges, do not like that serial or multiple bankruptcy filer. So please remember, there are options for you as a community association and as a manager in management. Be sure to get with your legal counsel to discuss those options. As Mary mentioned, there is no real limit on the number of times an owner can file bankruptcy, 
what it really turns on is how many times you file it within a certain period of time. And BAP CPA or the Bankruptcy Abuse Prevention and Consumer Protection Act of 2005, there are limits regarding the imposition of the automatic stay, depending on that filing history that Mary just went over, and then the ability of a debtor to receive a discharge of certain debts. There are certain debts that are non-dischargeable. And if that debtor doesn't do certain things, they may not get a discharge. They may close it without discharge, or you could get flat right dismissed out of a bankruptcy if you fail to do certain acts as a debtor. All right, Mary, what do we do? We've, we've got some sort of a notification. A manager or a board member receives a phone call saying that they're in bankruptcy or an email or a letter or affects what, what's the next step? What should the association do? Okay, so if the account is with RMWBH, please feel free to just reach out and pick up the phone and call me. Certainly uh, email over to me the document. Please attach the red exclamation mark and somewhere in there put notice of bankruptcy so that I, you know, we can spot real quickly that this is your first notice. Certainly feel free to call me. My direct line is 713-590-6497. Call me anytime. But the first thing that we have to do for your system and ours is flag the account as bankruptcy. And the purpose of flagging it is to unplug, pull the cord out of the wall, any automatic notices, automatic demand letters, automatic phone calls, anything of that nature that would potentially violate the stay. We want that to stop because as Clint explained, the whole purpose of the automatic stay imposed by 11 U.S.C. 362 under the Bankruptcy Code is to stop, what is it? Two words, any act. It's gonna stop, 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 any act, okay? So any act to foreclose, enforce, demand, threaten, that's what falls under there. So now if you're, say you're the manager or you're the accountant for the community, and a homeowner calls you on the phone. While it is true that when a debtor is represented by bankruptcy counsel, we're not to be openly communicating with them directly. However, when they initially tell you, oh, I filed bankruptcy, there are two pieces of information that they should impart to you. Number one is the case number which can be really important in with John Smith and Jane Smith, particularly, <laughs> and the petition date. But they don't have to give you the petition date and they don't have to give you the case number, but it really, really helps. And so if that happens, that interchange happens, feel free as soon as you get off the phone with them, having written down whatever case number they gave you, feel free to go right back to the phone, pick it up and call me. Okay, and we'll, we'll sort it out and we'll verify that it is an active bankruptcy because people love to say I'm in bankruptcy, especially when they're up against a deadline or a motion for summary judgment that Clint filed against them or something like that. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna make Clint the bad guy. No, just kidding. And so uh, what's gonna happen is they're gonna want to have the protection, but maybe they just got dismissed. But we won't know that until you notify us of the information that you were provided by the homeowner so we can verify it. So that's important. Once counsel is notified, no other notices need to be sent as long as you know the file is open here at RMWBH, we're working it, we flagged it as bankruptcy. So don't feel like you have to, you know, send over every time you get a what's called a BNC notice, which is just a, a certificate of mailing that the bankruptcy court generates automatically. I know they're annoying. I'm sure y'all have stacks of them. Just be sure that we know we, that we have that bankruptcy and we're working it, then you're good, except for two things, okay? Two things. One is a document called a notice of debtor's intention to strip your lien. 
when it relates to your association, okay? Sometimes it's called debtor's notice of intention to strip HOA lien. Sometimes it will say HOA lien. Sometimes it will say Park Lakes Property Owners Association specifically, but it's a notice of intention or intent to strip a lien. Clint's gonna cover that in just a minute. Now, the other one, that was one, the other one is objection to claim and the name of your association. That is the, those two are the most important things uh, of documents that you might get in the mail or from a homeowner or anywhere that please pick up the phone and call me and let's go over it together and make sure we know what we're doing. Because a notice for both an objection to a claim and to strip a lien carry a very short statutory time period that we have to respond, get your objection on file, get your response on file, whatever the case may be. So to summarize, we've got options here and it, it doesn't matter if we're the council or not, um, but you need to interact with council on this. So. Let's go through a hypothetical. Let's go through the phone call scenario. So you're on the phone with Miss Smith and she basically is talking about curing her delinquency, maybe doing a payment plan, something along those lines. And then many times, unfortunately, the owner will mention in a very offhand manner, oh, and by the way, you know, my husband just filed bankruptcy and he's on the title to the property too, but I don't think that'll be a, be a problem. So when you hear that active bankruptcy word, even though you're unsure whether or not the automatic stay applies to you, be sure to stop right then, then and there and say, Miss Smith, thank you so much, but because you, your husband is, an, is in an active bankruptcy, I can no longer speak with you regarding this matter. But could you please give me the case number and petition date? Then you write that case number down, you write that petition date down, and then you thank Ms. Smith for her time and you hang up the phone. After you're done with that, your management company will probably have some sort of an internal procedure that they follow. And that procedure is probably going to require some sort of bankruptcy flagging. In conjunction with you flagging that account so that none of those letters go out on that particular account, you also need to send an email, pick up the phone, some sort of communication with your counsel, to notify him or her of the active bankruptcy. Now, again, y'all may have some sort of internal procedure with proofs of claim and all that other good stuff, uh, but if you do not, you need to make sure your counsel is aware of the bankruptcy so that he or she can assist in the process. And then as Mary mentioned, the two big things that you really need to notify counsel of after the first steps have been established is that notice of intention to strip HOA lien or objection to claim. Those two documents are very big. Your counsel should be getting a copy of those as long as they file what's called a notice of appearance in the bankruptcy court. But let's belt and suspenders this and, and, and you provide that to your attorney the minute you get it because there's a very, very, very short time frame to respond and protect the association's claim. <clears throat> With that, I, th I think we may have one question here um, from anonymous attendee. Thank you, anonymous, for joining us today. Uh, is there a time limit after a bankruptcy is closed out or no longer active until you can proceed with attempting collections? So Mary, I'm gonna kick this off to you. We've got a bankruptcy dismissed. Can the association, the day of dismissal, rare back up and, and start collections right then and there? Or, or is there a wait and see type of approach? Giddy up. <laughs> That's a giddy up. <laughs> so as soon as you receive notice of a dismissal, specifically, and, and this can apply for discharge, but that's more complicated because we have to go through the analysis process, which Clint will allude to later. The dismissal, absolutely. Order of dismissal is verified, absolutely. But be careful because it is easy to mistake, especially when you're receiving bankruptcy notices by mail. It is easy to mistake a motion to dismiss that's been filed by the Chapter 13 trustee. It's easy to mistake it for a dismissal. Let me tell you why. Most trustees 
when they send the entire copy of the motion, they also send at the back a copy of the proposed order dismissing the case and it has the judge's name and everything. And so when they copy where they do like two pages to one page on their copy machine, it often comes at the very back. But when you open the, the envelope, you pull it out, it looks like the front. And I have had clients be very disappointed when they called and said, Mary, it got dismissed. And I went, what? No, I'm sorry, it didn't. Not yet. It might, but not yet. So just be aware of that if yes. you receive a lot of notices by mail. So on, on the dismissal, technically you can proceed that day. Uh, the debtor does have a certain period of time, however, to file kind of a motion to reinstate the bankruptcy. So we tend to recommend kind of a, hey, let's wait a little bit. If you really, really, really want to proceed with collections, yes, we can do it. But keep in mind that we may be out all those attorney's fees if the, if the owner files some sort of a motion to reinstate that gets granted and brings the bankruptcy back active again. So we like to wait a little bit, a couple weeks at the very least, uh, but technically, yes, you can proceed. So very good question, thank you. All right, let's move on to the next slide. Accounting, oh gosh. Why is it so important to have good accounting records when a bankruptcy gets filed? So Mary, you want to talk a little bit about splitting the hairs and pre-petition, post-petition. Absolutely. And if you don't mind, if I could just begin by spreading a little love here at RMWBH, we have a fabulous department called, we have several fabulous departments, but we have a fabulous department called LVA ledger verification advisors and it is led by a great leader Sai Tarak and his team and they are the most fabulous accountants and they check everything and they make sure that everything is collectible and that we're not going to have a lawsuit and so we work together very often because we have the applications or effects of the bankruptcy on an account. Now, for all of you clients out there, both community managers and accountants, I'm sure you'll agree that this can be the most frustrating and aggravating thing to have to deal with. Um, second, maybe only to rescission of a foreclosure <laughs> after writing off an account. That might be a second to it. So yes, so we tend to split our hairs. Mine is extremely frizzy today with this humidity. And uh, so it's really splitting. And so accounts, what we have to understand is accounts have to be split at the, at the bankruptcy petition date. Now, this is a good rule of thumb, whether or not your accounting software allows you to create two accounts or not. Some clients have an accounting system that allows them to create a wholly separate situation where there's a pre-petition and a post-petition. Now, are you totally required to do that? Not when you are represented by RMWBH because RMWBH has our, we have our fabulous LVA ledger verification department and so when we pursue collections, we're going straight from what is absolutely collectible. Now, this is why it's key if your accounting software does not have the ability to stop or split an account at the petition date. Because by having a, an account combined the entire time, you don't wanna run the risk of an accidental automatic generation of a statement to a homeowner that includes the pre-petition amount and certainly not demand for payment thereof and or threatening of action therewith. As Clint described earlier, you sure don't want that to happen. But what you have to keep in mind also, as all of you community accountants out there know well, is that it can really be a pain to take an account back and rejoin the two ledgers. So the key, again, is splitting at the petition date. 
the petition date is that stopgap point in time, that juncture that begins the twilight zone of the bankruptcy trip, okay? And so what you have to remember is splitting it or at least marking it at the petition date is just as important as flagging it. And the reason is because we don't want any accidental by inadvertence uh, any kind of statement going out to the homeowner. Now, some associations actually prefer, and what can happen is this can be very beneficial. They prefer to send post-petition statements themselves. That can get a little hairy, and if your association is looking to do that and you're represented by RMWBH, please call me and let's have a quick conference about it just to make sure that we're doing it right. But either way, splitting the account should stop the automatic generating of the account statements with any balances forward. And the balance forward or balance from previous management or whatever is a lot of times the way that a pre-petition balance is classified. And that's very dangerous. So please do not issue any statements that have any pre-petition amounts. Thank you, Mary. Uh, so let's get into a little bit of pre-petition and post-petition, Lindsay, on the next slide. And let's do this kind of as a, uh, as a hypothetical. So as Mary mentioned earlier, we've got two types of accountings that we're really dealing with. We're dealing with the pre-petition account. So those amounts due and owing prior to the date of the bankruptcy filing, that's split. And then we've got post-petition amounts due and owing so those amounts due and owing after the bankruptcy filing. So let's do hypothetical number one. We've got an owner, uh, we're dealing with a, an annual assessment uh, community. So January 1st of every year, the assessment becomes due and owing. John Smith, the debtor, files for bankruptcy protection on December 31st at 11 p.m. So one hour prior to midnight on the 31st. January 1st of 2021 rolls around and that annual assessment becomes due and owing. Is that 2021 assessment pre-petition or is it post-petition? So in this instance, that filing happened right before, one hour before that assessment become, became due and owing because the assessment becomes due and owing 12.01 on January 1st, 2021. So that 2021 assessment is a post-petition amount due and owing, which means it should be included on the post-petition ledger. Now, same type of situation, except uh, John Smith files for bankruptcy protection at 12.01 a.m. on January 1st, 2021. Well, in that instance, I would argue the 2021 assessment is pre-petition because the, the bankruptcy got filed at or after the, uh, the 2021 assessment became due and owing. So keep that in mind when you're splitting hairs, when you're splitting those accounts, you split at the petition date. Those amounts due and owing prior to, that's your pre-petition amount. Those amounts doing after, that's your post-petition amount to Mary's point on including or sending statements for post-petition balances, we are okay with you sending a statement of account. Just make sure it is a post-petition statement of account. You're not making any threats to turn over to the attorney, levy late fees, collection costs. There's a process you need to follow, but you can send the statement that shows them what their post-petition balance is. We've got plenty of community associations that effectively send it. We also have community associations that don't. And what happens when they don't? That kind of turns to one of our questions here. Uh, from Kelly, Kelly Rednicek. Hey Kelly, I hope you're doing well. Uh, hey Clint, what is the worst that can happen to an, to an HOA, to a community association, if an account does not get flagged? So the internal process for whatever reason fails, and a collection notice goes out by mistake. What is the worst that can happen? So we're gonna talk about this in a little bit, but it's called a violation of the automatic stay. 
and you can you can get damages uh, pretty pretty hefty pretty quick. We'll talk about those damages in a minute, Kelly. But very good question. Yes, there are repercussions for violating that automatic stay. Another question from uh, Miss Mary Kerr. Miss Kerr says the owner has been violating uh, policies, so governing documents, and the board wants me to speak to the owner. The owner has been kind enough to comply to some things. Now, hearing about what was what we can discuss so far, do we just allow the owner to continue to violate the deed restrictions without any kind of notice? The answer is no. You can absolutely interact with that owner as it relates to the deed restriction violations, but it's purely about fixing the deed restriction violations. Do not demand collection of late fees or fines or interest. Uh, don't threaten to charge the owner back the cost for self-help remedies. All those things you have to be very, very careful on doing. And if you want to look into those types of routes, I strongly recommend you get with your attorney, with your general counsel to discuss those options. But in terms of sending deed restriction violations and asking owners to comply with the restrictions, we are generally okay with that. There's just a way to do it. And, um, and again, if you're unsure whether or not the letter you want to send complies and doesn't violate the automatic stay, just send it to your attorney, send it to your general counsel. He and she should, he or she should be able to review it and advise you as to whether or not the letter looks good or whether or not there needs to be some changes. So that's deed restriction enforcement. You can absolutely do it. Uh, and there's just some steps you, you, you need to take. We've got another question here. Uh, Pre-petition debts include debts that post or accrue on or before the filing date. Yes, question mark, and the answer is yes. So petition date backwards, that's pre-petition. Petition date forward, that's post-petition. So pre-petition, yes, those amounts due and owing from the petition date backwards. Very good question. Uh, with that, so again, pre-petition, post-petition, attorney's fees that were incurred on a debt that's pre-petition should more than likely be included in the pre-petition amount. So attorney, I'm, I'm just going to use myself as an example. I'm trying to collect the 2020 assessment. I send a demand letter prior to the owner filing bankruptcy, but before the, but before the management company gets my bill, uh, they basically file for bankruptcy protection. And then I send my attorney fee invoice, which is roughly 30 days after I did the work because we have to review the invoice and all that other good stuff. Um, so the question is, can that money, that, that charge that I incurred to send the letter, can that relate to the pre-petition account? And the answer is yes, it can. All right, uh, one more question before we move on in terms of account splitting and pre versus post uh, from Kelly Busby. Uh, Kelly asks, should anything be said to homeowners about delinquencies regarding a bankruptcy at an annual meeting? So, generally speaking, you cannot disclose the rights uh, are basically disclose an owner's account activity because that would be a violation of their privacy rights. It's an, it's an invasion of their privacy. 209 provides some protection as well. You can speak broad stroke about the delinquency amount and you can speak broad stroke indicating that we've got some owners who have filed for bankruptcy protection and we're receiving payments from the bankruptcy trustee. I would recommend allowing your manager to kind of handle that, uh, that discussion, but do not get into particulars. It is just broad stroke discussion, but very, very good question. All right, uh, one more question. Well, we've, we've, got a, we've got another one that's on point. What if an owner has signed up for paperless email notification and they receive financial or deed restriction violations or notifications? If the financial notification is a demand for collections or threat to turn over, that is a no-no. So the financial notification may very likely violate the automatic stay. So make sure you've got your flag in place so that they do not get those email notifications because that still constitutes a violation of the automatic stay. 
as it relates to deed restriction notifications, again, as long as you're, you're wording it appropriately, notifying them of deed restriction violations is okay. Uh, so let's move on to proofs of claim. Mary, I'm gonna kick this off to you, what a POC is, what chapter it applies in, and what it covers. Okay, well, just to stay in line with my uh, being a big nerd, uh, let me just point out, if you'll notice on the slide, it says proofs of claim. A lot of people, and I have seen even attorneys do, do this, a lot of people say proof of claims. It's proofs of claim. I just wanted to point that out, just because I'm a nerd. Ha ha, everybody laugh at me. Okay, so the abbreviation is POC. A lot of times that means point of contact. Well, in a bankruptcy, it means a proof of claim. And so the proof is an establishment of an account at the position of the petition date, like we've been discussing. And these questions have been fabulous. Y'all are awesome. That is in accordance with federal rule of bankruptcy procedure 3002.1. According to that rule, we are required to provide a complete itemization. Again, a shout out to our LVA department. Complete itemization of all amounts, including interest, late fees, attorney's fees, DRV charges, all of them. So there is no claim that is acceptable that's a one lump sum amount that's your ending balance on your resident transaction report as of the petition date. Nope. Complete breakdown is required. Itemization is the proper term. Now, what's really painfully important about that is that bankruptcy judges have, they've done this before. We're not just trying to scare anybody. They will strike an improperly filed proof of claim, an improperly presented, wrong form. They just changed it again this April. A lot of y'all may not have realized that. It took me a while to realize it thanks to COVID. But or that's my excuse. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. Anyway, so bankruptcy judges can actually strike a proof of claim. Now, what does that mean? Strike? Oh, like strike, like it's not the kind in bowling. Okay. <laughs> no. So what it is, is more like baseball where you strike out. Yeah. And you don't get your claim paid. What happens then? The federal bankruptcy judge enters an order establishing that your claim is disallowed. Dis, you don't want to be dissed. Disallow. That means guess how much the trustee's going to pay. Big fat egg, zero. Now, if a debtor objects to one of your association's proofs of claim, then immediately, guess what? Let, let's say that that a, someone at an association decided to file a proof of claim on their own without RMWBH or other counsel. And they said, oh, oh, we got an objection in the mail. Oh, from the homeowner. Oh, they're mad. They don't like this. They say that these aren't justified. Oh, well, we'll just go in and file an amended claim. Guess what? You can't do that. It's called Bankruptcy Rule of Procedure 7015, and you can't do it. Once a debtor objects to your claim, files a formal objection to your claim, remember that notice that you're looking for in the mail and that stack of stuff in file 13? <laughs> Not to be confused with chapter 13, but don't put it in file 13. What we're talking about is the fact that if you go in and try to amend a claim without leave of court, guess what? Strike, you're out. Third strike, you're out. I'm just giving that as an example. So this is why it's so important to hire counsel for your association, especially when you're filing a proof of claim. There have been innumerable cases just in the last decade where creditors actually, believe it or not, were sanctioned. In fact, in one case, the newly appointed at the time, Chief Bankruptcy Judge David Jones 
issued a U.S. Marshal bench warrant for the attorney that was representing this particular creditor. Because, guess why? The debtor objected to the proof of claim and they did nothing. Now, while that seems like the cheap route to take, it's not smart. So just keep in mind that bankruptcy is a federal proceeding. Proofs of claim are a big deal. Proofs of claim, to Mary's point, can get you in a lot of trouble if they haven't been proved up properly basically is, is what we're trying to get at. And what a proof of claim is, is proving to the trustee, to the court, to the debtor and the debtor's counsel that you are entitled to certain pre-petition monies. So the proof is exactly what you think it is. It is your pre-petition accounting, right? It is a copy of the declaration of covenants, conditions, and restrictions, or your CCNRs, your DCCNRs, your deed restrictions that establish the right to collect your assessments. And if the matter has been at the attorney's office for an extended period of time, many times you've got to include an attorney's fees breakdown. So what those attorney's fees relate to as it relates to kind of proving up your, your money. Judge, here's what we're doing owing. And here's all the evidence proving that we are due this amount of money. So it's important to get those, to get that proof corrected. The other thing that we see a lot of problems with when a management company files their own proof of claim, and look, some management companies do a very good job about it. And, and if they've got a good process and procedure in place, then that's great. But when you're dealing with issues with proofs of claim, you can get into a lot of hot water and one of the big things we see a lot of is the inability to distinguish between secured amounts due and owing and unsecured amounts due and owing. So I'll do a quick little sidebar here. Secured amounts due and owing are those amounts that are secured against the property, which means they are foreclosable or lienable against the property. It's things like interest, assessments, collection costs, and attorney's fees. Those are your standard secured amounts. Late fees could be secured. It really depends on your governing documents. Unsecured amounts traditionally relate to more administrative costs or uh, fines or potentially late fees. And you've gotta be able to separate those, out, uh, those amounts due and owing out and say, look, trustee, judge, debtor, debtor's counsel, these amounts are lienable and these amounts are not. Because if you don't do it right, and the debtor or debtor's counsel calls you on it, or the trustee, there are certain trustees that monitor these things with a fine tooth comb, they're gonna file an objection, you're gonna be dragged down to the courthouse, and you're gonna have to get on the stand and explain why this was not done properly. So make sure you've got a good process or procedure in place as it relates to your proof of claims, because they're just important. Proofs of claims, sorry, Mary proofs of claim. Uh, and, and a question from uh, Kelly again before we move on. What is the current situation with COVID-19 in the courts regarding bankruptcies? Should the HOA and attorneys be proceeding as normal? So the answer is yes, you should be proceeding as normal. In relation to kind of bankruptcy courts, they're doing a lot more virtual hearings, virtual meetings, all that good stuff. But business is still moving. Look, owners still need to be able to get back off of their uh, get, you know, basically get back on their feet and turn over that new leaf. Bankruptcy courts acknowledge that and have allowed for certain leniency, some more stretches on response time, and then more active role in, in the virtual hearings and virtual creditors meetings, all those good bankruptcy actions. And, and again, if you're unsure on a particular bankruptcy action, you know, either use your internal process if, if you handle the bankruptcies yourselves in terms of management companies or reach out to your attorney. He or she should be able to help guide you. All right, let's see what we've got going on next. Oh, the lean strip. It's a pretty cool house, right? They, uh, they designed it upside down. I'd like to go in that thing, check it out. Uh, so first and foremost, lean stripping only available in Chapter 13 bankruptcies. The uh, United States Supreme Court a few years back considered whether or not lien stripping could apply to a Chapter 7 bankruptcy. 
And they said, no, it cannot apply. So lien stripping only applies to chapter 13 bankruptcies. It occurs when the fair market value of the home is less than the mortgage plus taxes. So fair market value is less than the mortgage plus taxes. So let's go through a hypothetical here. We've got a home that is worth $100,000. We've got a mortgage that is $95,000. And then we've got past due taxes of $6,000. So let's do our addition here, right? Fair market value 100. And then we've got our taxes plus our mortgage at 101. So $1,000 over the fair market value and the association's got a $3,000 lien. Are we subject to a lien strip? The answer is yes. Why? Because the home is underwater by how much? $1,000, right? Debt of, one of, of 101,000, and then the fair market value is $100,000. So that's kind of how lien stripping works in a, in a nutshell. Uh, but the association may be able to fight the good fight and file an objection to the lien strip. So let's talk about how that works. Moving on to the next slide, Lindsay. Thank you. So in order for the HOA to actually be stripped, number one, uh, let's talk about what we wanna do. Let's move on to the response portion. So John Smith files their notice of lien strip. We have 28 days to respond to that lien strip. That's why it's so important, as Mary and I mentioned earlier, to the minute you get that lien strip, turn it over to your counsel as soon as possible because he or she's going to have to do an analysis. So as I mentioned, the big sticking point for lien strips have to do with what the fair market value of the home really is. What do debtors usually rely on to establish fair market value? They usually rely on the appraisal district's fair market valuation. And they say that's what the fair market value is. So one of the first things your attorney should be doing is looking at comps in the area. And if the comps support fair market roughly, uh, then let's rely on whatever that fair market value is in the appraisal district, uh, on the appraisal district website. If however, the comps are significantly different from what the appraisal district lists as fair market, well then, we've got some options. And we go back to the association and say, association, we've got comps of anywhere from 150 to 180, but the fair market value is listed at 110. So we've got at least a $40,000 difference. We think we should be able to fight this and try to win it. Grant us approval to respond to this notice of intent to, to strip the lien. Uh, the association will either say yes or no, we file our response and we attach or reference the comps that we have pulled from local websites. Now, is that evidence we get to use in court? No, it's not. It's not evidence we get to use in court, but maybe it is enough for us to negotiate with the debtor's attorney to try to meet in the middle or get some sort of resolution. If it's not, then the next step is hiring an expert hiring an appraiser to go out to the property, do an appraisal of the property, and then use that expert report, either in paper format or dragging the appraiser down to the courthouse uh, is more than likely so that they've got an opportunity to cross-examine that appraiser at the hearing. So again, if we're dealing with a lot of money due and owing that we're subject to getting stripped on, it may be worth those funds to fight the good fight. If, however, we're only dealing with 500, 400, maybe a thousand in assessments, then we're gonna do our best to negotiate with the debtor's attorney and try to get something because something is better than nothing. And we're more than likely gonna advise the association not to spend the money on attorney's fees, not to spend the money on the appraiser because it's gonna cost more than the, than the claim is worth. So all of that keep in mind, it's important to really work with counsel on that, but there are ways to fight that good fight. Now, in order for the strip, the lien strip to actually be successful, the plan, number one, has to be confirmed. And then number two, the debtor actually has to receive a chapter 13 
discharge, and Mary will go into the differences between a dismissal and a discharge here shortly, but if, if the chapter 13 has not been discharged, do not write the account off. So even though the lien strip was successful, you should be getting an email from your counsel saying, hey, they were successful, but don't write your pre-petition balance off. Keep it off to the side, hold on to it, because if there is a dismissal of the bankruptcy, it is like the lien strip never happened, which means the association can continue its collection efforts. Um, so that is lien stripping in a nutshell, valuation evidence. Um, before, and, and yeah, so we, we can move on to the next slide on violating the automatic stay, but I've got a good question from uh, Jamie Patterson. Will you touch on the difference between a chapter 7, 11, and 13? Absolutely. So I'll do seven and then Mary, I'll push over 13 to you. A chapter seven, I liken to the Band-Aid. That basically means it is hard, it's fast, and it hurts a lot. Uh, but when a debtor files for a chapter seven bankruptcy, you basically don't take any action because most of the time it's what's called a no asset bankruptcy, which means you do not have to file any kind of proofs of claim or anything like that in a chapter seven. If, it's an, if it is an asset chapter seven, which we very rarely see, make sure your counsel's involved so that he or she can advise you on what to do. Let's assume it's a no asset chapter seven. They've decided to keep the home and we're done with the chapter seven in three months. So let's assume hypothetically for a chapter seven, we've got $5,000 in pre-petition amounts due and owing and John Smith gets their discharge. Congrats, John, you, you know, you have made it through the seven, you got, got to turn over the new leaf and start over. That relieves John of the personal liability for that $5,000. John is in the clear. He as a person no longer owes the $5,000. But, here's the but, the property still owes the $5,000, why? because our lien, our $5,000, is secured against the dirt. So a chapter seven discharge only relieves the, basically the uh, personal liability of the debtor, John Smith, but it doesn't relieve the liability that the property has. So we say, John, great job. You relieved your personal liability. Oh, by the way, the property still owes the money and we're gonna come after it and foreclose on the property. Not you, not you, John, we're not coming after you. We're only coming after the property. So that's the big thing for the seven. It's quick, fast, it hurts, but you still have some lien rights after that chapter seven gets discharged, assuming it, it gets completed and not dismissed. Mary, you wanna speak briefly on chapter 13. We only have a couple minutes left and we still have one, one or two slides. Sure. So chapter 13 is the chapter of the bankruptcy code that was brought to us uh, thanks and whole, wholly, wholly by the Great Depression. So after the Great Depression, government decided that people needed a way to be able to clear themselves of the debt that was accumulated that they couldn't pay and that it would be, you know, very uncivilized to throw everybody in a debtor jail like they used to in the 1800s. So we have chapter 13, it's called a wage earner bankruptcy. And what can be frustrating is when people without gainful employment or continual gainful employment get the break of chapter 13, That's, that can be very frustrating. Thank you, Mary. So that's kind of the distinction between sevens and thirteens. Elevens really deal with entities, most of the time businesses filing for bankruptcy protection. They want to reorganize the, uh, the entity or groups of entities. It's much more convoluted and complicated. Make sure you've got your attorney involved on elevens because they are not easy to deal with. Uh, moving over to the violations of the automatic stay, and this kind of goes back to Kelly's question, what happens if we accidentally send this letter and violate the automatic stay? We talked about ways you can do it, so we won't discuss that anymore, but what happens when you do it? So 11 USC 362 is kind of considered a strict liability statute. 
as Mary mentioned, it's two words, any action. So the first question is, was there an active bankruptcy? If the answer is yes, you move to question number two. Did you send a letter that violated the automatic stay? If the answer is yes, then that's it. You are in violation of 11 USC 362. Now, as it relates to damages, there's a third question. Did you have knowledge about the bankruptcy? What does knowledge mean? If they put a notice in the mail addressed to the proper address and you received it, even though it got lost in translation, lost under a pile of correspondence, you had notice. So when you've got notice of, of, this, of the bankruptcy and you violated the bankruptcy, you have to pay, assuming there's a lawsuit, emotional distress damages, any kind of actual damages, which we really don't see that often because a letter doesn't really cause actual damages. Most of the time it's more emotional distress, actual damages, and attorney's fees. Attorney's fees. Attorney's fees, single biggest cost when we're dealing with most of community association violations of the automatic stay. Uh, Mary just assisted one of our attorneys at our law firm in 2019 with a case and they were able, able to settle it for $10,000. $10,000 for a letter. It's just not worth it. So make sure, do your best to have the proper safeguards in place, flag the account properly. If you ever have a, have a question on what to do right or wrong, reach out to your counsel. He or she hopefully will be able to guide you on, on the correct course of action. And I think we've got one more slide. Yeah, so deed restriction violations we've already hit on. We can go to the next slide. Okay, dismissal versus discharge. Uh, Mary, we've got, we've got about three minutes left. Give, me, give, us your, give us your trick for managers to understand the difference between a discharge and a dismissal. Okay, so if you think in terms of the word dismissal, dis, they were dissed, we were dissed, that's bad for the homeowner. It's good for us, <laughs> but it's bad for the homeowner because it means that they did not complete the requirements. They, are, they have no more protection. And for us, it's like the bankruptcy never happened, except that during the time that the homeowner was in the bankruptcy, okay, the statute of limitations was not running. Now, on a discharge, think of it like an honorable military discharge. He was honorably discharged. It was honorable. Well, it may not have been as far as what they did to their HOA in the bankruptcy, but it's honorable to the extent that they completed the required course. They completed the Chapter 13 plan payments. The trustee made distribution and their personal liability on all of the debts has been discharged. It's, it's gone. It's extinguished. It affects the amounts on our HOA ledger, okay? And we'll have to deal with that. Hopefully, uh, you know, you'll allow us to help you. But the discharge injunction lawsuits are on the, on the rise. Now, what this means real quickly is just like where you have a viola violation of the automatic stay, you can have a violation of the discharge injunction. It's 11 U.S.C. Section 523 G16. Okay, so you can also be sued and sanctioned and fined by a federal court for violating discharge injunction whereby you're making demand or threatening action against any homeowner for amounts that are actually affected by a discharge. Again, seek Council. Thank you, Mary. Uh, so again, that's kind of the big distinctions between dismissals and discharges. And in both cases, depending on the length of the bankruptcy, you may have to send a new 209 letter. You may have to reinstitute litigation for the dismissal. Uh, and that's where it, it kind of, it's really important for 
your attorney, uh, he or she should do what's called a closing analysis. And they'll review the bankruptcy and then they'll give advice to the management company. What to do? Should a new 209 letter be issued? How much should we write off if it's a discharge? Is there anything that should be written off? Um, how much can we collect? Look, you may be able to collect more than four years of the amounts due and owing. The standard rule of thumb is we can go back four years to collect assessments, but active bankruptcies allow for what's called tolling of the statute of limitations. Think of it as kind of like a freeze ray as it relates to that statute of limitations clock. And it may allow you to collect for four, five, six, seven, eight, nine years of assessments, depending on how long that bankruptcy has lasted. So again, it's, it's really important. You have counsel kind of look at all that and give you an opinion because you want to do it the right way and you don't want to give away money. There may be a monies that you can collect uh, with that. Mary and I want to thank you all so much for coming today and joining us. I hope you all got a little bit out of the Bankruptcy 101. And look, Mary and I could probably each spend four hours talking about bankruptcy and all the nuances. So if you all are interested in doing a kind of a 201 or a 102 type scenario, please let us know. We're, we're happy to speak on this subject. It's I think Mary and I are both kind of bankruptcy nerds, so we, we enjoy the, the topic. And uh, thank you all for having us. Enjoy your day.